Okay, so for the next presentation, um, who's familiar with uh, Eric Dollard's work? Most of you. So um, there is a nonprofit, uh, EPD Laboratories Inc. It's a 501c3 registered in uh, Nevada, and um, it completely runs on donations uh, through PayPal, through the mail, whatever. It helps pay the bills. Uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago or so, we've got the building down in uh, Nevada completely paid off. Uh, but it, obviously there's operating expenses and uh, there's some uh, property we have uh, uh, rights to on some government land where uh, some seismographs are and some other stuff. And so any kind of donations help. It is tax deductible. And uh, the website, if you go to ericpdollard.com, in the right column you'll see a uh, PayPal donate link and then there's also an address in Spokane, Washington. For this next presentation, um, this is an extension to uh, some of Oliver uh, Heaviside's work, uh, electromagnetic induction and its propagation. And this uh, presentation will be about three hours, and this is going to be covering some work that Eric has really wanted to do for many, many years. But towards the end of the presentation, there's a musical element to this, where Eric will come over here to the uh, mixing board area, and will play a soundtrack, which will be playing on the Bose 911s on uh, either side of the stage and uh, kind of unifying you know, electrical engineering, math, sequence algebra, and the music of Bach and Handel. And so anyway, help me welcome Eric Dollard. So this is kind of a get down to business presentation. There's not gonna be a lot of beautiful scenery and colors and old equipment and all that. This is uh, a get down to business so what I've done here, this is kind of an extension of um, the electromagnetic boundary condition chapter in my presentation called the electrical utility, what was it, the history, theory, and practice of the electrical utility system. So electromagnetic induction and its propagation was a series of papers presented by Oliver Heaviside to a... Uh, electrical periodical at the time, and this is basically where the theory of electromagnetic induction found its origin. Heaviside, uh, because of all the excitement at the time of the new discoveries and theories and what have you, kind of ran off in a bunch of different directions, and if he would have stuck to the problem of analyzing the uh, propagation constant of the undersea telegraph cables that didn't work for reasons they couldn't figure out, he figured it out. Uh, that enraged the, uh, the bureaucrat, uh, whatever element, and then they banned any further publication of his works. But uh, fortunately, in, in all of the progress of history from that point on, AT&T got a hold of the idea, and uh, some guy grabbed on, it was Pupin that grabbed on the heavy size idea and then got a patent on it without giving the dime to heavy size. But we know all those stories. So this is what... When he stopped, uh, this starts. And then Steinmetz comes in here because basically Heaviside was, um, he got all those guys going. He laid the groundwork. So this is probably going to be the most compact course on electrical transmission engineering that anybody's ever produced. And, uh, and the entire theoretical basis will be completely developed from Maxwell's equations without any calculus or goofiness or any of that. It's kind of a arduous process to work through it. Uh, I'm going to try to avoid as much of that stuff as possible and get down to the actual power lines that we'll be analyzing. And uh, most importantly of all, the relationship between power force and energy and electric induction, which is the new element that was introduced through the Steinmetz theories. Magnet anything involved with magnetism will be to the best of the ability of the drawings to be symbolized by the color red to make things easier to understand. Dielectricity will be green. Uh, the electric medium, well, the blue has a couple different color codes, but um, it'll be used for something else later. And in general, purple or violet represents the unity of the magnetic and the dielectric into either electric induction or electromagnetic induction which are things that we're going to have to define. Okay, so now we'll, these are the players here. 
This is, it's really important to understand what these symbols mean because everything is built upon these. So this is the, uh, this is the cast of characters, you might say. So we're going to take a quantity of electric induction by Steinmetz's definition, which is a, a union of magnetism and dielectricity, and that's what we're going to split it into. We're going to represent it in Steinmetz's representation. So that's the product of the magnetism and the dielectricity. That's equation number one. There's the little numbers on the upper corner there. Okay, so these are basically the standard elements of electrical engineering. So we're going to break the magnetism down into its two constituent components. Basically, this is the beginning of the heavy side equation what's known as the heaviside telegraph equation. We just arrived at its, its first uh, appearance from a mathematical development standpoint. This is basically what gave us electrical engineering and long distance telephone. Now the coordinate systems. Uh, I have to give a whole four hour presentation on this, but we'll just skip over it. That's the next one, is coordinate systems. But we have a basic coordinate system which has the four operators. So the J was a coordinate system or dimensional transition for electromotive force and electrostatic potential. And then the K was the other way around for the conduction current and the displacement current. And because we're using these as mathematical operators, then we have to define, when we go back here, what happens uh, when we use these things, kind of what do they mean and how do we absorb them into the algebraic process? And this is what the genius of Steinmetz figured out, was how to do that. Okay, now, in order to make the electromagnetism move here, we have to get rid of all the resistance and conductance. So this line has no attenuation constant. Um, we didn't really get into what that is, but this is directly taken out of Steinmetz's chapter. He did calculations on a line like that, so we're, we're getting to that. Uh, there's no losses in the line. We'll get rid of the resistance and we'll get rid of the leakage. And uh, we get to stick with the electromagnetic end of it. So we need a, uh, a distance angle to tell us where we are along the line. It's another hyperbolic function. In this case, it, uh, it expresses itself circularly because we're dealing with alternating current. So we already know how to get the propagation constant. So if we multiply that, which basically tells us how fast is it going down the line by the length of the line, then that gives us the distance angle of the line, so to speak, depending upon where you're measuring along it. So the, the lambda in this case is, uh, is, a, is our distance variable. How many miles down the line are we? The beta tells us how is the line at what rate or velocity is it sending down the line, and the product of those two things gives us the angle of the line, which is important because then we can connect that with a trigonometric function. So basically, that will be similar to the power factor in the prior equations. We will call that the distance angle function, but where the power factor was a function of space or time, in this case, it's a function of, of distance. And I'll have some diagrams later that make it clear. So we know from either measurement or geometric considerations what the natural impedance and the natural admittance of the line. Uh, the geometry of this line is such that it has a natural impedance of uh, what technicians would normally call 200 ohms. But more, because there's no resistors here, uh, we're going to call it 200 zobels. So we have basically the two things we're after, the line angle, which represents the propagation constant, and the natural impedance of the line. So what we want at the receiving end is 60,000 volts 
phase voltage so that everybody will have 120 volts at their outlet, no more, no less. The amount of light bulbs or whatever connected at the other end of the line is such that the receiving end of this line is consuming, so to speak, 200 amperes of conduction current. So this is what the voltmeter and amp meter read at the switchboard at the receiving end of the line that those towers and what have you are connected to. So in order for this to be the case, if we take the ratio of receiving end voltage to receiving end current, then that tells us that the line is terminated by an impedance, which in this case is a resistance, so we have to call it ohms, it's all light bulbs. So there's a 300 ohm resistor connected to each phase of the line. And because we're going to start our clock at the end of the line phase-wise, then the distance angle is zero at the end of the line. So we're going to do all of our calculations and or measurements from the receiving end of the line because everything is set such that the receiving end of the line is the normal established voltage of 120 or whatever is derived from 120 by the transformer ratio. So we can take, and uh, from our prior measurements and what have you, from Steinmetz's equations, and we come up with the displacement current of the line, which is basically the product of the potential of the line and, it, and the natural admittance of the line. So the displacement current of the line is 300 amperes. The electromotive force of the line is the product of the current flow in the line and the characteristic impedance of the line, and that gives us 40,000 volts. Now, I have to point out here, these are not things that you can measure with voltmeters or amp meters. Electromotive force and displacement current cannot be measured, and not under uh, electromagnetic circumstances. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the real last question right here. Okay. I was asking if your calculations with the propagation constant, if you had to take that into account as far as your telephonic earthquake system. Um, oh, that's very important. You always have to take that into account. No matter what it is, you have to take the propagation constant and the natural impedance into account. And you have to engineer those to be what you want. And sometimes they can become rather crazy values. You, like infinite, you know, no propagation velocity, superluminal, where the propagation constant doesn't have a velocity term, just like in here we deliberately took out the attenuation term. Uh, it can be complex like it is when you add a term. That, that is how you're going to make all your echoes and what have you when you're receiving in an antenna. You've got to make sure all that stuff lines up. 